You know, what this history can tell us is that democracies can be more vulnerable than we think, that um, things can change much more quickly than we think, that, that, that institutions that we think are solid are actually much more fragile than perhaps we believe, and that the catalyst for this terrible change for the worst can be economic crisis. It's Wednesday, 17 October in Maastricht, uh, the Netherlands, and we're speaking with Lawrence Rees. Uh, you are the uh, writer and producer of many uh, series about the Second World War, and also many books, uh, including uh, one which was just released, The Dark Charisma of Adolf Hitler. And this evening you'll be giving the annual Tanz Lecture uh, here at Maastricht University, and the title is going to be The Charisma of Adolf Hitler. Welcome. Thank you. Um, the name of your first, oh, I should say, your 1997 documentary, uh, The Nazis, A Warning from History. Uh, I'd like to start by asking if you can uh, give us an important example of um, what kind of warning the Third Reich provides for us today. What should we not do as a society? Well, I don't think um, the first thing to say is history doesn't offer lessons. And, and the way the end of the question was put there was a kind of a letter which is a prescriptive sense of what do we not do. I don't think you can look at it like that. You can't look at it like that because situations never repeat exactly. Individuals obviously never repeat uh, genetically. Uh, so you can't say exactly what shouldn't we do. By warning what I mean is that there are certain thrusts in history that you can point to uh, that, that can lead possibly to certain consequences. And what I meant by warning in the context of Nazis' warning from history was to talk about, for example, how fragile the institutions around us are. Um, in 1928, the Nazi party got only 2.6% of the vote, more than 97% of Germans opposed Hitler. And yet, four years later, he's leader of the biggest party in Germany, and a few months later, he's chancellor. It changes so quickly. Everything is more, institutions, I believe, can be much more fragile than we imagine. So that's one thing. And the second thing is to look at how rapidly things can change once there's economic catastrophe. Because what changes between 1928 and 1932 isn't the character Adolf Hitler. What changes is the economic situation. There's something I've wanted to ask you uh, since April of 2005. I heard you uh, being interviewed on Fresh Air, uh, which is on an American uh, a radio show on NPR, National Public Radio. Um, and at the end of the interview, you said the following uh, as regards the, um, the SS, uh, the Schutzstaffel. Um, uh, a big fear I've got now about uh, people of absolute faith. I always thought faith could only be a positive thing. Uh, everyone talks about the importance of having faith. Well, these guys had faith, absolute faith. And there's one desperately upsetting moment in the book where I talk about how Himmler and Huss admired as prisoners Jehovah's Witnesses. They pointed to them and said, see that faith? That's the kind of faith we need in our Fuhrer. Absolute, unshakable faith. Um, that was seven years ago. How has your uh, perspective on this kind of faith evolved since then? Or has it evolved? It, I, mean, um, I think that broadly, I was going to say, broadly I would agree with myself. Uh, I, I, I would broadly agree with that. The work I've done most recently on the nature of charismatic leadership, I think has made me more understand the communality of it, the sense in which uh, charisma is only possible in a relationship. We have a tendency to think if, if you say to somebody, uh, have you met anyone and you think has got charisma? Most people can think of one or two people who think they've got charisma. And then they talk about the other person and say, oh, well, the reason I think they've got charisma is this or that. What they don't talk about is, I think, at least half of the equation, which is why they feel it. So that it's in them. There's a need that's being spoken to in them. So if I was to nuance what you've just read again now, I, I, I guess I would add only that that what faith is, is a two-way street. That there's something else coming to you 
from this because that's what charismatic leadership's about, that you're feeling something off this person that is making a connection with you. It's not hypnotism, it's not a drug. You are making a rational, or you feel a rational connection here with this person, and it's that that's creating the, the, the charisma. Chris Hedges, who's a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist, uh, in 2007 published a book called uh, American Fascists about the Christian right. He made the argument that um, uh, he saw a fascist threat uh, potentially emerging from uh, American fundamentalist movements. Um, but that's not the question. The question I want to ask you is, um, do you see any, any, any trends of this nature emerging, especially in this time of the financial crisis, where you see the warning signs of uh, something, something like the Third Reich? Well, I think the, the first thing to say is, is um, I'm not qualified to know in the sense that I haven't studied in detail any of these emerging right-wing parties. So I absolutely you know, can't, point, can't point to um, direct parallels. Equally, uh, 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 one thing I really hate is politicians going, he's another Hitler. You know, uh, I can't remember, didn't they describe, didn't Bush describe Saddam Hussein as, there's another Hitler. You know, just drives me crazy because th there's no such thing as another. There can never be another Hitler. That this is, the, 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 absolutely, that's not how you, it seems to me that's a totally misunderstanding about what the value of history is. It, you, there is not going to be another Hitler. So, so to say, well, Look, um, you've got these situations here in, 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 in Europe now, and, and let's, let's see how many tick parallels we can. I mean, it, it's, it's, it's simplistic and it's, it's not how history works because one of the reasons we have a problem sometimes in understanding, for example, the charismatic leadership of Adolf Hitler, is because we only have half the equation. You look at him on, on, on the archive, and there's this ranting, just deeply, profoundly unattractive personality. And it's a mystery. You think, well, how can people have felt this? And the answer is because you're not there. You're not in that situation. So, so I don't know that you can, that in terms of how you've, you've posed it, I don't know. All I would say is, to go back to the warning idea, which I think is legitimate, um, it's absolutely surely the case that we, history does offer a number of examples of how economic crisis causes rapid political stress change to the extremes. I saw a blog post where you mentioned the rise of the uh, Nazi party in Greece. Well, are they? They deny, of course, they're Nazis. Oh, they do? Okay, okay, my, my mistake. No, but they, they, there's a number of similarities. No, 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 no. And Greece, I absolutely, I, 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 absolutely. Where, where, but what I don't say is it's another Hitler or it's another, you know. What I, what I absolutely hope people understand is that, that things can change extremely you know, what this history can tell us is that democracies can be more vulnerable than we think, that um, things can change much more quickly than we think, that, that, that institutions that we think are solid are actually much more fragile than perhaps we believe, and that the catalyst for this terrible change for the worst can be economic crisis. So all of those things, it seems to me, are, are warnings. Does it mean when you see those it inevitably goes this way? No, it doesn't. Because I think if you recognize uh, um, uh, those warnings, it won't. Um, but you have to be aware that the biggest enemy I think people face uh, is, in all sorts of ways, is complacency about the world we're in. I've met so many people from this period who talk about how things can so suddenly change. And, and I think somehow, as human beings, we don't want to believe that, that things can just change in an instant. But let me ask you about another, uh, another thing you said, this time on Radio 4. Um, I'm just going to read the quote to you. Um, is it inevitable, and this was a question posed by the announcer, uh, that if the economy of Europe in total collapses, then disaster of the sort we've seen over the last 70 years will follow? Now, your answer, I think, I think you were also under time constraints, uh, but you answered by describing uh, the formation of the European coal and steel community. And you said uh, in th that it was set up to, in a way, to prevent Germany from having uh, um, unilateral access to these two resources of war and also to involve it in the economy. Um, <clears throat> but, I, I, so, but, but, yeah, I, I guess we're, we're getting back to this question, the, the, the same question. Uh, that, that if the economy of Europe uh, does collapse, 
how possible is it that we see, the, like, like the, uh, the gentleman said, the same kind of disaster? This, uh... I, I, I don't know. I wish I did know. I don't know, but it's clearly a, a risk. I mean, I don't know. Um, I don't know because what you hope is that people understand that it can't ever, it mustn't ever be allowed to come to that. I think that from the people I talked to who were in the 1930s, or we interviewed for the original series I did on this, it's plain that, that a, a huge change happens when banks crash. When you're middle class and you've got savings in banks and, and you feel, you know, is, what is the saying is, it's as safe as the Bank of England, you know, uh, that, that you feel this is bank. And, and, so, and I remember listening on the radio a few months back where someone said that, that, that there was this economist saying, long before the big problems in Greece, said the, the, the Greece must collapse because there's, 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 there's the economy must collapse. And they said, don't be ridiculous. Countries' economies can't collapse. You know, and there's a sense that, that, that these things can't, kind of can't happen. Um, and I do think that, that, that um, people losing their savings and banks, big banks crashing, mm -hmm. uh, uh, how that wouldn't drive politics to the extreme. Because by definition, existing politics would have been seen to fail, wouldn't they? Along these lines, um, uh, there's um, uh, in, in the, this recent book, uh, In the Garden of, of the Beasts by Eric Larson, he talks about Ambassador Dodd, who was uh, in Germany during the time of the rise of the Third Reich. Um, there, there's a part of the book where it says, uh, what most occupied the attention of the State Department was the outstanding German debt to American creditors. Um, yeah. It was a strange juxtaposition in Germany. There was blood, viscera, and gunfire. At the State Department in Washington, there was mounting frustration with Dodd for failing to press America's case. I'm wondering, how much do you think reparation payments um, at the time inhibited um, politicians from doing something about Hitler while they still could? Was it a, was it a big factor in... I, I think that, that well, it's very interesting, that piece, because it chimes completely with... Uh, I did the last series I did was uh, a World War II Behind Closed Doors, which was looking really about the relationship between Roosevelt, Churchill and Stalin. And, and uh, uh, I, I, I had one of the most distinguished uh, uh, American academic consultants or experts in Roosevelt's foreign policy as a consultant and I would talk to him about you know Roosevelt's fascinating character you know trying to understand his motivations doesn't keep a diary doesn't keep one confidence very hard to penetrate what actually is, is he's doing and uh, this professor said to me look he said Lawrence you're overcomplicating it just imagine in your mind 99% of the time you're thinking how will this play to the American voter? And it seems to me that's, 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 not, I mean, that's not a bad way of, of, you know, and so what you described is, what are the Americans interested in? What are the American voters interested in? They're interested in reparations. They're interested in getting the just returns and so on. Are they also interested in not having Nazism and Hitler and so on? Yes, but that's not such an immediate interest. And one of the problems, it seems to me, one of the many, many reasons I could never be a uh, um, a, a politician or a statesman of any kind is, is because how you manage these competing claims, how do you distinguish between the um, important and the immediate? That seems to me to be an incredibly difficult task for any politician because the temptation must always be to deal with the immediate. And the immediate is not always the important. So what they were dealing with there was the immediate issue, which is reparations. But there was something important, much more important, which is what happens if this man stays in power and carries on, and we feed into that. And seeking reparations, uh, war reparations from Germany, um, could it correlate to perhaps seeking a, a full payment of debt from uh, uh, Greece, again. Portugal? Spain? Again, you see, you can't, you can't, it doesn't work, you can't do that. You can't, you can't, because um, uh, there is, you know, uh, you, 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 you know, no, I mean, the answer is, the answer is, the answer is no, you can't really look at it like that because, because, um, you know, who do you, it's like, I saw one sort of, some sort of one game where uh, that someone tried to do by analogies. Okay, now today, if Saddam is Hitler, who's Churchill? And they were, you know, they were, they were kind of like trying to do this whole thing about, and then it was a great parody in this, some satirical magazine where they did, well, hang on, if Saddam is Hitler, then is Churchill, so, you know. And so in, in your analogy, is reparation, is, is America Germany or is, you know. So 
so, so no, I don't think you can, you, you, you can't use a template like that and in, I don't believe and, in, and, in, and impose it on history. Um, but, but could things go, could things go wrong? Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm.